think we're going to start. Uh, hi and welcome to our showcase. Um, we are very glad to have you here. Um, today we want to give you some insight in the commerce, commerce project we recently launched. Uh, we are um, Mario Thiele. I work as a Drupal developer for Unique. And this is my colleague, Kai. Uh, yeah, he works apparently in the same company and yeah, he did the project management on this project. Um, thanks to Daniel Mano smith for the project, uh, for the photo. This was taken only two days ago. Yeah, unbelievable <laughs> what two days of TrooperCon made out of us. Um, so this is what we're going to show today. Um, this is our roadmap. We first going to show you the business case and the customer vision of what we did. And after that, we will show two workflows in detail on this platform. Then we sum things up a bit, and there should be time for questions afterwards. We play a bit kind of ping pong. Kai is talking about the business topics, and me, I'm talking about technical stuff. OK. So, the business case. Um, there's a vision of the platform, which is in German because it's a Swiss platform, von der Gefahr zum Produkt, which roughly translates to hazard-driven product selection. And you will see now why this is the case. Um, so this is a marketplace for safety equipment. And our customer who we built this platform for is a Swiss insurance company, Suva, one of the big insurers in Switzerland. And they provide a marketplace, but they don't sell products themselves, but vendors do. There are over 60 <coughs> vendors on the platform, and this will have some consequences. We will see later what we did in this project. Um, the, pro the, the products that are sold there are, for example, breathing masks, safety shoes, and stuff like that. And those are highly specialized, and we will also see um, this in the workflows. Um, there are over 10,000 products to give you a rough, rough idea with 50,000 variations. And um, because the products are rather specialized, we had about 20 different product types um, that we need to manage. The platform is multilingual, typical in Switzerland, so there is uh, German, French, and Italian. Um, because it's a marketplace, there are very different requirements from the different stakeholders. So on the one hand side, there's the Mark Plus owner, so Suva, the insurance company, who provides the platform, and the team of Suva is also maintaining like the basic settings and the vendor settings and stuff like that, but they don't sell products themselves. But because they are an uh, insurance company, um, they really strive for highly accurate product description because they want to protect the end clients from the hazards that they may face in their work or private life. Um, so this also means that the marketplace owner controls the product for the product um, information before they go online. We will also talk about this later. Um, the vendors on the other side really create the products on the platform. They sell them, they ship them, um, their own products. And yeah, they just want a modern UI with good workflows so they can uh, work with the, with the platform and they need some further statistics and stuff like that, and discounts that they really can, can work with the platform. Um, the last big stakeholder is obviously the customer. Um, those are mostly small to medium-sized companies um, they, which need products for, for their daily work where they have hazards. Um, yeah, when they, for example, I don't know, build a house and then they need the, the safety shoes um, for their workers. Um, yeah, they just want a, a good shopping experience over all the vendors on the whole platform. Okay. So to give you a first idea what this looks like, the final product, this is just a, a short intro video um, where you can see the home page and then we navigate through one to one of the categories where we see a large faceted search. Um, and this search is really to find the right product for the hazard um, that, is, uh, that the customer is facing. Um, when we see here on the de detail page, we have some product description, um, some images in the product uh, 
further safety information about the product, linked products, which we'll also see later, and some information about the vendor. And yeah, then obviously it's a shop, so we can add it to the cart. Sometimes there are linked products that you have to buy with it. Um, yeah, then we have the, the checkout workflow at the end, which is also special, but we will not cover that in detail today. Okay. So, yeah, let me give you a high-level impression of what we needed to build. So, there are multiple stores, obviously, with access rules. It means each store owner should only be access his own store. We have this variety of product types and product variation types. We have a custom product creation workflow we have to build. I'll come to that later. We have a like advanced publishing process where with different states um, yeah, to ensure there's no bad product data coming to yeah, or gets published. Um, yeah, we have to create like backend access for vendors, customers, and platform administrators. We have an extended faceted search, right? We, yeah, we extended the facets itself with additional information in the front end. And yeah, we did a migration for all the products, uh, but this is not part of this talk today. So, to achieve our goals, um, we, yeah, we used Drupal, this was the right ecosystem. The, our key advantage was its extensibility to build all the things on top of Drupal. It was sure a mix of contrib modules and custom modules we, we were using. Um, from contrib, we used uh, Commerce 2 as a base. Um, it was version 2.10 when we started. Um, Commerce 2 did the heavy lifting. It was a solid base. It gave us product types, stores, orders, a checkout process, and the whole commerce ecosystem. Um, we did not use the commerce marketplace module. It wasn't a fit for us. It was too far from, from our case. We checked that out. Um, we also used the state machine module to, for the publishing flow search API and facets for sure, to name just a few. Now let's switch over to the product creation workflow. <coughs> okay, so like, like we said, I will introduce you shortly to the requirements that came from the customer and then Mario will tell you the details um, for, for each of the, of the steps we will see. Um, so like I said, the requirement is really that we have accurate product information um, because this is the most important thing on this platform, um, that we have a step-by-step -step process and it's not too over overwhelming for the vendors and at the end there's, that there's no specific training needed because each of these vendors usually has multiple persons, so we're talking about over 100 uh, editors who need to create products and the product ac uh, information should be accurate, so this is like a mix um, that um, we had to take into account in the whole designing process. So, what do we want to achieve in a product creation workflow? In overall, we want to create multilingual commerce product entities and its variations with translations, additional attributes to classify them, and all of this should happen in a multi-step process. Together with our UX team, we identified seven steps uh, that are required to create these products. I give you a short diagram from our internal documentation. Um, yeah, first of all, we select the catalog entry um, to determine the product category and the product type itself. Um, then we fill up base information for the product, manage all the variations, add them, delete them, and so on. And add filter attributes like facets, um, translate everything, add additional products, and yeah, provide a preview. And all of this could only be achieved by using uh, custom forms, entity forms, entity listings, like built with list builder. Um, yeah, we check the contract landscape to find a suitable solution for this multi-step process. There was nothing really around, so yeah, we built this 
on, on a custom way. Now, what we did was creating a custom controller that, that handles all of these seven steps. And yeah, that extended the form controller from, from um, the product form controller itself. And this controller was responsible for all the actions for stepping forward, backward, and so on. Okay. So, like we've seen, the first step is the category selection. Um, so, we have different product information depending on the product type. So, it's important before we can have any form for the product that we know which product type it is. Um, and the requirement was that there's like a logical, hierarchical structure. Um, this is based on, on norms, safety norms that are out there that they need to follow and that they find the right um, product in the right category. So yeah, you can imagine a safety shoe has really different um, attributes from, sa uh, from safety goggles or breathing masks. So we need to take this into account. So the customer should select um, a product category, uh, but not a product type. This was a, a goal from, from UX perspective to achieve that. We created a custom adjectified form that behaves like kind of hierarchical select. And someone knows that module, but it's a bit, yeah, a bit different. Um, yeah, the custom, the hierarchical structure itself came from a vocabulary tree, and terms in the deepest level can are reference to a product type, and so we could uh, achieve. Like we could say eye protection category references to the product type classes, and this is how it's selected. So there's a video. So first of all, yeah, user logs in. So this is the store administrator, so a store owner, and he has like a dashboard, and he adds a new product. I have to excuse a bit, it's in, in German, we could not make it to translate it back to English, so I will explain it. So now he the store owner navigates through the category and decides to go with a breathing protection mask and steps over to the next, um, next page. Because now we know he wants to have product type inhalation protection. Um, and yeah, then he's able to fill up in step two the product details. Mm -hmm. um, for the product details, like we said, different product information depend, uh, depending on the, on the product type needs to be filled in. Um, additionally, a uh, requirement was that for each field or for each section of the forms, there need to be additional information to support the vendors who are sometimes yeah, not the expert or not so, so tech savvy. Um, so there was um, the requirement that we provide relevant information to the vendor in each, each field that they know what they fill in here. So we had like 20 different product types and we had to bring them into this multi-step process. So we decided to go with custom form modes for each step. So each product has like a form mode for product details or for step two, and so we, we are flexible enough to yeah, fulfill all edge cases. Um, yeah, the store itself is hidden there and the product category because we, we know that already. Um, yeah, and this is how it looks like actually. This is on the left hand side, there's some. Um, some information boxes, we call it field notifications, we will come to that later. Um, and yeah, this is actually a, yeah, a product entity form, uh, like beautified um, or styled. You fill up a title, a description and the brand, upload an image. And these are the minimum required fields to create a product uh, product entity. Everything that's coming up from now is additional information. Okay, so now we have a product, but without the variation we can't sell it, so the next step is the variation. Um, also here, depending on the product type, different fields like before. 
Um, also, the additional information is uh, back on there. Um, and we had to deal with a mix of um, order relevant data and just additional information. And some of these uh, are like uh, free text uh, fields. Um, yeah, the, the order relevant information is, for example, color or size, which are relevant to, to determine the variation. And the additional information is just something that we may show to the customer. So, for example, the vendor product ID or something like that. Or we show it to the customer, oh, it's important for, for the vendor themselves, um, yeah, for their, for their product um, management. Step three is a process on its own. It's not only a single form, but it's uh, multiple routes that go to step three. That means we have, we have like listings of variations, we have adding new variations in this step, duplicate existing variations, edit and delete uh, them. Um, we used auto SKU module here for some yeah, it's like commerce internal reasons because the SKU must be unique and we cannot guarantee that each store has its unique ID on, on their products. Um, and we added the possibility to insert free text attributes um, to not select the attribute value itself from a list, but to enter it by hand, like let's say you, you have a, a color, a new shiny color, uh, light green, for example, that is not in the list, you could add it to, to the list itself. Um, this, the special thing about it here is that um, the, these are determining a variation. That means if you, you can make out of this free text attributes, you can form new variations that are relevant for the order and can put into cart. We pruned out here in this process the translation completely um, because this, they are covered in a, in a single step, in a translation step. So this is the whole process so of adding a variation. So we enter an article number, the SKU, so our custom SKU, the price, the tax rate, the order quantity, the order unit, mandatory fields, and availabilities, and yeah, some some more information. Now we have, we press the button save and duplicate. And now we have like duplicated the first variation, and we, now we go to the next uh, step. Yeah, we order some informations and save it. Now we see the listing. We should see the listing exactly. Um, and yeah, we have these operation buttons. We start this list. You might know them from the back end. Yeah. From so, and so now we have like two variations. They're untranslated. And the next step is adding like filter attributes. OK, so the filter attribute, we mentioned that before, is more um, related to the use case. So these are really the. Um, safety relevant information, for example, um, for safety shoes, which sole you have on them, or for a breathing mask, which filter needs to be in there to protect from the hazards um, that the customers are facing. Um, those are not for all product types because some are not that specific and just uh, are normal products and don't have these filters. Um, the filter attributes are actually then grouped into filter groups. And the special thing here is that the attributes and the groups can have logical relations to other attributes and groups for, um, yes, to include or exclude um, something. When you select one of the items, then something else is excluded or included based on some rules um, that are uh, configured. Yeah, this was the most complicated form at all in this process. Uh, we heavily used Ajax forms and actions here, like the native ones provided by Drupal, to achieve like edit, save, and reset stuff. Um, filter groups and filter entities um, are custom entities with custom widgets. Um, yeah, they have dependencies, as Kai mentioned, and hierarchies. The, the customer also requested like a widget that contains a mix of radios and check button, uh, check boxes, which was weird, but 
there was a use case to do so. Um, yeah, and each checkbox itself had some additional information um, to, to show in this tooltip. So this is how it looks like. So this is the tooltip, the additional information of this filter attribute. It's selected. Now, now we see, yeah, it's, um, yeah, there's only one option possible for the multiple use because it's a mask with integrated filter that, that the one use. Now they use full masks. And now we can, yeah, proceed to the next level. So this was very quick, I know. Um, but it should simply give you an impression on how this worked out. So the customer itself, they will spend a lot of time in this form to add new, uh, the correct uh, product information because this is required for finding them and and to display them on the product detail page with the right information. So now we head over to translations. Mm -hmm. um, step five, the translation. So like we mentioned, the marketplace is multilingual, three languages. Um, and each vendor is um, required to provide some a subset of this, or all of them, in their contract. So there's maybe a vendor who just enters um, the stuff in German, but there can be like uh, all three languages put in here. So if you know yeah, the back end of Drupal Commerce or the back end of uh, Drupal, how they handle uh, translation, this is not very special. It's simply like styled. Um, so, all this is also like a multi-step, or um, yeah, multi-action process where where we list and edit and delete translations, um, and yeah, this is how it works. You add a translation. This is like exactly like it l looks in the backend of Drupal. So. Yeah, simply add the French translation, and that's it. Um, the sixth step is spare parts and combination products. So spare part, I mean, is uh, yeah pretty pretty obvious. Each product can have a spare part that can just be linked. But there's the other thing that's combination products. That's for example, if you have a mask. Then there is the filter on top, and this combination then prevents or protects the customer from the hazard. So the combination product is not a spare part, but something you need to have uh, with the product. We created a form mode here, uh, yeah, with entity reference autocomplete widget and some field groups. You will see that um, there's nothing special so far except that the autocomplete widget only finds product in the current store or in the store uh, the user is in and um, the combination product field becomes mandatory based on filter attributes in step four or even not so it's me like for example a precinct mask can only provide a specific protection level with the right combined filter so this is the reason behind. So yeah, this is it. So we, yeah, this is this autocomplete widget there. And as you can see with the asterisks on top, it's marked as mandatory. And now we are in the preview. OK, um, step four is the, the preview or review step. Um, this was quite important to the customer so that the, the vendors see what the product would look like before they finish it. Um, so this should be a, a almost realistic, uh, or it should be a realistic preview with almost the same design as they will see it uh, in the front and for the end customer. Um, the preview should consider different languages and different view modes. And yeah, Mario will explain how it is. Yeah, this is the last step before products goes into this approval process. Actually, we do nothing like else like looping through all the languages and render the product in teaser and full view mode. Um, we had to disable some buttons, some like add to cart, so it cannot be checked out by accident. Um, 
And what we also do is perform a high level integrity check on this product data. Like does the product has variations? Are there any filter options for the product set? Um, have all contract languages been covered or is there a combination product, uh, a required combination product already filled up? If all the validation passes, the products get the state needs review and it's passed over to Suva, the marketplace owner, and for the review process. In this step, this is the preview. We see the teaser and the full view mode there. Um, add to cart is disabled. Um, yeah, the tabs are still working. Um, yeah, below there's the French uh, translation we created previously. And on top we see this uh, orange step five translation is missing, warning, so it cannot pass over to the next step. So obviously the store is required to have three languages. Um, yeah, they add some additional information and save this translation. Now when we go back to step seven, yes, you can step over some steps or choose them manually. Um, yeah, you get all the or the languages, and now you can pass it over for to get controlled, or to get reviewed. So it's actually a product listing, but this is not covered here. So now I'm going to show you or give you some insights on the um, product review workflow. Okay, so the, the product is now ready from the vendor side, um, but it needs to go through the control of the marketplace, uh, marketplace owner. As we said before, um, the accurate product information is most important, so this is why this step happens. Um, the marketplace owner controls the product, and what is an additional requirement is that they can mark mistakes and give some feedback um, why this is wrong. So this is now where the stuff that you saw on the right always comes into place. Yeah, the main goal is to decide whether a product is publishable or not. We used a state machine for that. We gave that favor to workflows because it was more handy to us. Um, what, what we also had to do is to, to facilitate the communication between the marketplace owner and the vendor uh, to and, and make this communication very efficient because otherwise they cannot have like emails or phone calls to do this. So this happens in place in, in the product. First, let's have a look in the product publishing flow. This is actually what our state machine YAML file is like uh, with all the transitions. So we have it like first, when what we see the product what the whole time was in draft and edit mode. It was offline and not not, yeah, published. <laughs> um, then now when, when all seven steps are passed and the validation, validation passes, it gets over to review. Um, and now it's in the marketplace uh, QS. Um, yeah, to, this marketplace owner decides if the product gets rejected and it gets back to the, um, to the edit mode. The um, store owner gets an email about this, he gets an email on every transition in the states, and if the product is approved, it, it gets published and is online. If the product, if the store owner itself wants to edit this product again um, and edit some you know, critical fields, it's, um, the product is must be disabled again. So, the, as long as the product is online, the, some fields, some security relevant fields are right protected. So, and yeah, there's also this unpublished state uh, if a product is outdated or so, you can like, yeah, remove it. So, the next slides are about the review uh, process and how we facilitated this communication between two, these two stakeholders. So, what you saw in, when creating a product on the um, on the right hand side, there was these boxes I, I mentioned here. They are like yellow, they were white before, but there's a different reason. Um, and these boxes give some advices to the store owner when they fill up products, 
like rules. What do you need to think about when you fill up these uh, products? For example, there's uh, the name has to be self-explaining. So add some more information if that isn't the case, or do not place like attributes or uh, brand names in in this title. So this. Um, these fields or this information, these are like also custom entities we created, these field notification entities, and they are attached to the field configuration. So um, this is the view of the vendor, and now we can switch over to the perspective of the marketplace owner. The marketplace owner itself he also has this view, but he has a checkbox where you can say, okay, this rule is not passed, I check it. And once the, this, um, this checkbox is activated, there, there's the possibility to have like uh, in place commenting on this. So they check it and say, okay, it's, uh, you violate against the rule. Um, there's obviously Uvex, which is a brand name inside the um, inside the title, so th it, this net needs get to removed. So they check the box, and the product gets then back to the draft state. So once this happens, there is some communication taking place. So the blue ones are uh, like um, the the server or the the, the product, uh, the marketplace owner, and the gray ones these are the store owners and they say okay this shouldn't be in in this category and they say thanks fi fixed uh, yeah and this is how we facilitated this and we we used like because this checkbox or this um this text area on on top is this field notification is a content entity and we could easily connect uh, comments to these content entities. So this is basically the comment uh, workflow from core. Um, and the last functionality we put out of the review um, of the review process is the, the quality statistics. So every time one of these checkboxes is enabled and there's a mistake, um, the vendor sees this on his dashboard, what was rejected, what was the problem, and he can try to get better and more efficient, and the product will pass um, the quality control faster without um, going back to needs work and stuff like that. Um, for, for the SUVA, so for SUVA, for the marketplace owner, this is also handy because they see where they may need more information in the whole process to um, increase, uh, to pro, uh, make it better and they can do this on different levels for the whole marketplace on each vendor or even down to one user. Okay, um, so those were the, the two workflows we wanted to show you. Um, a short conclusion, there's a lot more that we did not show here um, and we don't, didn't have time, so like Mario mentioned there was a rather big migration happening from a uh, Microsoft SQL data, database, which was fun and a <laughs> small project in itself. Um, we have vendor stores, so this means each of these 60 vendors has a, a unique URL that they can use and when a customer comes in via this URL, um, the whole marketplace is like a small, is a little bit changed that it only shows the product from this specific vendor and out of the box there's like a, a vendor store that they can use um, and communicate to their customers that only shows their products. Um, the checkout process, like we saw a, a, small, a small snippet before, um, is also um, changed because, um, because of the requirements. Each of the stores need to have their own checkout and own um, payment possibilities and we put uh, also sales statistics for the vendors um, into the marketplace so they can download their most uh, or they can find out what products were sold most and stuff like this. Um, we did this for the customer, so what were the, the big improvements for the customer? Um, the first one is that they, um, they got rid of their custom implemented shop and we use now Drupal state-of-the-art framework and uh, a really new refresh design. 
Um, the product creation workflow was definitely one of the biggest changes for them because before it was like one big form with confusing buttons and now they have like a, a clear um, designed workflow and they obviously benefit from the open source community if they need changes this is way, way more efficient now uh, when we can look for contrib modules or in profit from, from all the stuff that Drupal offers us. Um, some project details, as I'm a project manager, I have to say two words about it. Um, we went live with this almost half a year ago. Um, we worked for, for 10 months, 16 sprints on this. Um, the core team was nine people, four of them Drupal developers back in and front end. Um, yeah, and last but not least, community contribution, always important. Uh, we have been uh, a nominee for the, for the Splash Awards on Monday. Sadly, we did not win our category, but yeah, nothing we can do about this. Um, we published a case study on Drupal.org. If you want to find out more and also about the stuff that uh, we did not cover here, you can find it on Drupal.org. Um, we contributed to some, uh, so to some modules that Mario mentioned that we used um, and we presented this case or parts of this case at, at the local Zurich user group meetups and yeah, discussed some of the stuff with the people there. Okay, thank you for your time. Special thanks to, to Nico, one of our colleagues who did all the videos, the screencasts. Um, and now we have a few minutes left for questions. Feel free to ask, yes. We, we can hear you, but I don't know if yeah, the rest can. Speak louder, and it will mm. be recorded. Okay. So, uh, hello. Whole project. Uh, yeah. I always admire custom solutions, uh, but I always fear, you know, to leave industry standards, especially for shop manager. In, in that case, you know, can you tell a little bit more how about the shipment process work and all the return handling and stock management and all those things? <laughs> <laughs> that you can. also have in this shop solution? Mm -hmm. um, so the case here is that we don't have to deal with it because all this happens at the vendor side. So each of the vendor um, has his own yeah, oh, back end um, and they don't handle this in Drupal. So they do all the shipping and return and it's not covered on the platform. This is, this is just Due to the to the history of this of this platform, that it was never the case, also in the in the solution before, and that the vendors are really really different. So this, some of them are just one person who does this all in Excel or something like that, and some of them are like uh, 20 people uh, do this, and they have uh, other backend systems, but they are not connected at the moment. We are talking with with our customer if we do this in a in a later step, but at the moment this is totally out of the marketplace. to integrate with the, the vendor IT systems? No. IT no, we did not. So this is all the, the product creation and all the stuff that comes afterwards is done by hand by the vendors. Um, there's no integration into any other system apart from the migration at the beginning of the project. Yes. Which was the hardest uh, implementation in this project? Because I have uh, bad experience with Drupal Commerce. I tried sometimes and uh, it has uh, a lot of unfinished things. So <laughs> actually the hardest part of this project from my point of view was the uh, filter pages stuff and this was not related to Drupal Commerce at all. Um, we had a quite good experience with this so because it has a very stable API so the, we, we had no problems with that so there was like like a change of how um, product variations are handled like in I think in 2.11 there was like a change where you did not necessarily need inline entity forms inside on the 
yeah, to create variations on the product. Um, and this helped us to create this multi-step process. So, and actually, I, yeah, I, I do not have, and we had no problems by commerce itself. So this was not, not an obstacle. We had different uh, difficulties like the migration with MS SQL or with like these custom filtering workflows, uh, but but not, yeah. So yeah. Okay, so my my colleagues are nodding. So it's, yeah. <laughs> Use the stack machine module. Yeah. Have you considered uh, working with workflow, for example? Um, yeah. So we we compared them, and as far as I remember, workflow was a bit more uh, backend user oriented. It has, as far as I remember, a backend UI, and but this is not. We did didn't want to create a new workflows dynamically and arrange them or so. Our workflow was very clear and, and State Machine gave us uh, a clean API. It was, I'm not sure if it's more lightweight than workflows, but it was more handy to our case and we could easily set up these states and act on transitions and this was exactly the perfect fit for our use case. For example, when we do a transition, Send an email or so, and this was, yeah, exactly what we needed in this case. So, why did you take the product offline if some critical fields are changed and did not uh, add a, a draft and uh, leave the, pro, uh, the product online until the draft is uh, approved? Um, yes, we we discussed about this. So, the the first thing is that the requirement was really clear from the customer that. Um, the, the vendor is not allowed to change anything safety related, so he can change the price or the availability um, without taking the product on, uh, offline, um, but for safety relevant information um, it had, uh, it had to, to go to the approval process um, again. Like you said, we could uh, have done a, re a revision or something like that, but this was just to, to timing and budget constraints that we did not implement this. Um, it will come at a later state, but not not yet. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how did you did you manage the construction of the catalog structure uh, with uh, filter attributes entities uh, and uh, filter attributes values entities custom entities you said? Mm -hmm. uh, but how uh, d does it move around? Uh, year or is it easily um, administrated or, or uh, because I uh, for, for me it's very different in Drupal you know with the, uh, the product types uh, like the EAV uh, model in uh, Magento as an example is more which is for me more flexible about this um. So, so basically the, the product category is taxonomy, so you can easily change and always the, the lowest level has a product, um, a product type connected to it, the taxonomy term. Um, so this is the, the relation between the two. Um, what was not implemented and we are not sure if the customer really want to do it um, is that you can change a product type after you created the product. This is some we should uh, do a little migration then if they if this changed and this was not implemented um, all the other stuff the filters and uh, field notifications are entities which are linked to the product type and so yeah you can change every every piece of it so it's yeah. flexible yeah it's quite flexible yes i think we run out of time uh, okay thank you for your attention yeah.